and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where, sorry Avatar haters, but it looks like the saying, never bet against Jim Cameron, still holds. I mean, it's not an iron grip, but it's still holding on. I don't know why anyone is a, is a hater against Avatar. I mean, even James Cameron's pot shots at other franchises are so stupid and transparent. Who cares? He's just embarrassing himself. Now, I know it can be frustrating to see Disney dominate every single frickin' time. But speaking of Disney, I think one of the reasons that you see so many people in the industry rooting for Avatar, although there are haters everywhere these days, but I think that there is some concern that other types of storytelling just simply can't compete with Marvel and Star Wars, which is why there's often so much hating in the industry against Marvel. And I think that people are looking for Avatar to prove that other, other types of storytelling and other creatives and, and, and brands can compete, which is why people were so thrilled that Top Gun Maverick did well and that Jurassic World is still able to compete and uh, you know just barely reach a billion dollars. And that's good, as we often discuss. You'd want a, you want a competitive marketplace because it makes everyone better, including Marvel and Star Wars. When Marvel and, I think we've seen the results of easy wins for Marvel and Star Wars. It's significantly impacted the quality of those franchises, an issue that they're both currently dealing with. That's one of the reasons we want to see DC back on online because you know it just benefits everyone all right so despite a once in a generation storm i hope all of you were safe and didn't have too bad a situation for those of you uh in the united states uh and the surrounding areas affected by that storm santa managed to make it through and deliver some good box office numbers to hollywood santa Come on, the reality is that it was moviegoers who braved the weather outside that was frightful and opted to go out to theaters, when they, the ones that were still open, despite a cornucopia of, uh, of options on streaming, where it was all warm and cozy and you didn't have to go outside. Um, I know some people lost power, though, but that, of course, would affect movie theaters in the region as well. But that, that's the Christmas miracle, that movies are still alive, even when severely challenged. So that's very promising. We want, we want all corners of the industry to be working. Uh, maybe there was enough viewership for everyone, speaking of we want enough for everybody. Uh, and over the next few weeks, we will find out how streaming performed for Christmas as Netflix and Nielsen numbers come in. But today, let's take a look at the box office, which basically still delivers results in real time. Not just because it's a decades-old, well-oiled reporting machine, but because these headlines help sell tickets. <laughs> That's why, why does Hollywood do anything? As I always tell you, it's when they can make a buck off of it. Uh, yes, as I expected, it was an Avatar and Shrek Christmas. Not a bad Christmas at all. Uh, I actually watched my Puss in Boots screener again uh, for the holiday, um, like on Christ for Christmas Eve. Uh, in the morning, it's so good. Really, really good. And uh, those two movies not only did the bulk of the box office, but pretty much the only business at the box office, as the rest of the top ten was bleak. Oh, so bad. So the movie business isn't, like, totally back. I mean, I think more competition. You know, I think a lot of people would look at the rest of the top ten and be like, those movies are not that great. And so, again, it's like, step up your game, Hollywood. If you want people to go out to the theater, you're going to have to do better than you should see this movie, you know, for either because it's nominated for a lot of awards or because it's a big IP. You know, make sure that people actually, there's a reason to actually go see it. Uh, this morning, uh, let's talk, so we'll talk about Avatar uh, 2 first, obviously. So this morning, it was reported that Avatar 2 beat its three-day prediction by almost 10 million. You know, some numbers did come out on Christmas Day, uh, but Christmas, you know, is not a usual Sunday. You know, when, you know, Sunday, they can usually predict how Sunday's going to go, but they weren't sure how Christmas Day was going to go this year because movie theaters have been having a problem. The weather's been just so horrible in the country. Uh, so they, they underestimated. And so it was a very big difference, which is why I'm doing movie math on Mondays for the, uh, for these two holidays. Uh, and it is now, because usually, again, as I said, they can very accurately predict Sunday, you know, when it's not a non-holiday situation. And now it's expected to come close to, if not clear, 100 million for the four days. Is this a four-day weekend? Well, in fact, at least in the United States, it is. Because when Christmas falls, Christmas Eve is on a Saturday and Christmas Day is on a Sunday, understandably, employees go, do you mean I don't get any days off? And so the country decided that, yes, you get Monday off. So it still is a holiday weekend because, you know, otherwise you would be cheated of any uh, d days off. You'd have to like, use your vacation days. And so today is a holiday and as will next Monday be as well. 
Uh, Avatar 2 is quickly closing in, so close already to 1 billion after just its second weekend. While it took Top Gun Maverick 31 days to join the Billion Dollar Club and Jurassic World Dominion four months. But hey, it got there. It got there. Uh, it took Rogue One 39 days to reach a billion. You know, earlier this, uh, you know, this past week on a, a stream, we talked about how Avatar 2 might be performing similar to Rogue One. Not so. It's surpassing Rogue One. 30, it's not 39 days. It's gonna Avatar 2 will reach a billion dollars this week, if not in the next day or so. Because uh, today is just day 11 for Avatar 2. If Avatar 2 can reach a billion in 19 days, like the first one did. It, it, will make, it also will make the all-time top 10 list of fastest films to reach a billion. But again, at the rate it's going, it's not going to take 19 days even. It should probably reach a billion dollars in the, like the next couple of days, and that's a conservative prediction. So you're looking maybe around day 15-ish, or maybe even better. So we'll see. We'll know, we'll know next, next movie math. Uh, if it hits a billion during the week when I'm doing a stream, we'll talk, it on that, I'll talk about it on that date in the stream as well. Uh, this week, I think, though, is going to be very telling for Avatar 2's box office uh, total. Uh, because now that Christmas is unwrapped uh, and the weather is getting better, uh, a four-hour trip to the multiplex might be a little bit more agreeable to some people. You're like, now I got nothing but time. Let's go, let's go put our feet up in a recliner uh, at a premium theater, get some popcorn and soda, and watch this thing. Uh, the weather is, I have my, again, I'm, as I told you before, I'm planning myself to go again this week. Uh, the weather, though, is expected to get downright spring-like for New Year's weekend, which is delightful for all of us, but not so great for movie theaters, because then you might be like, wow, like in New York, it's supposed to be close to 60 degrees, and you might be like, I would like to be outside for that. But on New Year's Day, most things are closed, and you'll already have been outside a bunch, uh, you know, the other couple of days. So maybe you, do, you will want to park yourself in a theater on New Year's Day for four hours. I can definitely see that happening. So I think overall, Avatar 2 could do some of its best business this week. I think this is going to be a big week for the, for the movie. And if it's not, then that would be a problem. But at the rate it's going, I think it will be. Now, yes, obviously, I'm sure some of you are like, Grace... Bring it up, be honest, be clear. And so yes, a 52% second weekend drop is 50% worse than the 2% second weekend drop of the, of, uh, the first Avatar. Yes, that is a very big difference. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that the sequel won't get anywhere near 3 billion. But does it have to? Uh, I mean, again, the first Avatar played for months. It was a very, very slow burn. You know, if this Avatar gets to a very high, uh, you know, box office number faster, I don't think anyone's going to be complaining. It's just, you know, it just, again, is how the movie business has changed. And Avatar is no longer a wild card. It's you now, you know, first it shook up the industry, but now it's part of the establishment. Not only in that it's, you know, the Avatar franchise, but now it's also a Disney film. Uh, that is, it is a Disney film. It is a Disney film. Again, the movie needs a billion to break even, and it's about to reach that. So after that, it'll be all gravy, man. I still think it could edge out Top Gun Maverick, currently the 11th highest grossing film of all time. And maybe at the rate it's going, it could even maybe, maybe I think, get close to 2 billion, like Spider-Man No Way Home. I think that's a possibility. But you know what? If Avatar 2 can just break into the all-time top 10... That would be huge for the Disney acquired franchise. And on that note, remember, IP is more valuable to Disney than other studios because Disney has so many more ways to make money off of IP, from their theme parks to their merch to their streaming service. Also, to be honest with you, I think Disney just does kind of get a kick out of blocking other studios. I really do. I think that they're like, we just want to put our foot on the neck of everybody else and not let up. I mean, you saw Kevin Feige, I think, to some degree destroy DC with some very aggressive moves and, you know, doing a lot of their stuff. You know, it's, he, it was, the Russo brothers outed him as greenlighting Captain America Civil War when they said, that, uh, DC said they were going to make Batman v Superman. And, uh, you know, it works. It works. The other studio, and the other studios just take it, man. The other studios just take it. All right, so as with the first film, the overseas market is doing a lot of heavy lifting. They really are. And now that the World Cup is over, I, you know, I've been talking about all the things that might have been holding back Avatar 2 out of the gate. And a lot of you were like, what about the World Cup, Grace? And I think you're right. You know, and you might recall with the last Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom, that actually dealt with the World Cup by opening like a month in advance over, overseas. Um, so, but now the World Cup is over. Uh, and many countries did have second weekend drops in the single digits as people came out to see Avatar 2. And very strong midweek numbers as well. So that's another reason I think the film could do boffo business in this coming, this, this coming week, the week that we're in. 
But my thoughts from last weekend still hold. Jimmy Cameron must find a way to bring down the cost of these films. Nobody should be making movies that cost more than $250 million before advertising. Maybe I would let him spend $300 million if he can keep getting consistently in the top 10 movies of all time. That would be okay. But come on, 460? That's just ridiculous. That's your farting around on my dime. That's like Taika Waititi on uh, Thor Love and Thunder, where you make a four hour cut. I think there's like a, like what, a nine hour cut? There's a rumor that that's floating around of Avatar 2. Ain't nobody want to watch that, Jim. Stop spending all my money. Uh, all right, so I mean, do you want to watch a nine hour cut of Avatar 2? I mean, I, I think because the story doesn't seem that much different from the first one, who would want to watch like, what, like uh, six more hours of the same thing? I'd be like, come on. All right. We'll see, though. We'll see. Release it when nothing else is coming out, and maybe we'll be all over it. Uh, so, all right. So, so bring down the budget. Also, the story on that, also what I was just talking about, the story needs to be radically different from entry to entry so that audiences really can not only tell them apart. Uh, it's very hard to make poster frames for this movie. I'm like, I got to make sure water or one of the kids is in there somewhere so you can tell them talking about Avatar 2. But they got to make this radically different so that people, more people feel it's not, so, it's not so hard to convince people to check it out. And while I don't know what Cameron has planned for Avatar 4 and 5, maybe that's where it gets radically different, but I got to tell you, it would be very hard for me to green light 4 and 5. Just do the trilogy, do the trilogy, Cameron, and then use this 3D, 3D technology and James Cameron on other stuff. I'm not saying that Disney can't make more Avatar movies down the line, but give your audience a break. I think every, even Marvel is showing that you can have fatigue, and people thought that would never happen to Marvel. Uh, you know, you give people a little bit of a break, and then you can bring in new talent to tell the stories of new characters. I mean, you don't want the Avatar franchise to become weighed down by the Sullys, just as the Star Wars franchise came to be weighed down by the Skywalkers. And who would have ever thought that could happen? But they just ran those Skywalkers into the ground. Uh, all right. I also still feel that theaters need to invest in building more premium screens, as those are the showtimes that are still t selling the most tickets. In fact, you have moviegoers waiting to see Avatar 2 until they can get the seat that they want, not only because of the technology, but you're going to have to sit there for four hours. So you want a good seat. And, and with Hollywood becoming a blockbuster-based business, clearly these additional premium screens will stay booked and busy all year round. I mean, enough of this, you get your premium screens for a week. How is that a problem in 2023 uh, with, the, with the way things are and how uh, it, you know, we've become such an entertainment-based society? All right, as for Puss in Boots, they're like, why are you watching stuff at home? And you're like, I don't want to sit in your metal folding chair for that, that time. All right. As for Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, the film is doing pretty good. Not as well as I would have hoped. Posting numbers slightly behind Sing 2 from last Christmas and also from Universal, but from a different animation studio, Illumination versus DreamWorks. Ah, oh, Universal. They're the quiet competitor with Disney. They have just such great IP. They have theme parks as well. Uh, they're really getting their... Uh, Epic Universe will be opening soon. Uh, and they have a plethora of animation. Uh, they ha I mean, they have two animation houses as well, just like Disney does. Uh, it's been a decade since the last Trek movie. Coincidentally, the first Puss in Boots, which was the weakest of the franchise since the first installment. So maybe not the best choice to wake up the franchise again. But at the rate this new movie is going, there's no way it will even match the first Puss in Boots 554 worldwide. Sing 2 just managed to crack 400 million worldwide, I think partially because of the pandemic, although we're still having pandemic issues this winter as well. Uh, but I think Puss can maybe get 400 million plus if it's lucky. But I think at the way that it debuted at this rate, I think it will do the bulk of its business on uh, digital and Peacock, to be honest with you. But the movie's fabulous. This is not... This is, this is not great, but I don't think it's game over for Shrek before the franchise can manage to reemerge. Uh, it has far better audience scores than the first Puss in Boots flick. So as more and more audiences discover this sequel in theaters and then on digital and then eventually on Peacock with streaming, um, and then it'll, I think sometimes these movies eventually even go to Netflix after that, I think interest in the Shrek franchise will slowly go from a similar, simmer to a boil, because it really is just such a fantastic film. If you haven't seen Puss in Boots 2 yet, why not? But if you haven't, I mean, look at these audience scores. But if you haven't seen it yet, why not? And when are you waiting to see it? What do you think is the sweet spot for this? I mean, obviously, they want Shrek to be feature film fair, uh, but, you know, they have a lot of, they have some damage control to do. It didn't end on, exactly end on a high note. Also, let's see who wins Best Animated Feature. It's probably going to be Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio or Mar Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. 
I think it should be Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. But if it can just get nominated, that will help a lot too. Only three of the five, I think it was five Shrek films, have been nominated for Best Animated Feature, including the first Puss, by the way. First Puss in Boots. And the original Shrek actually won the thing. Two other movies debuted for Christmas, but just barely. Now, usually the debut of I Want to Dance with Somebody would have been embarrassing. But one, the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, they didn't have a cinema score for this movie for some reason, but the Rotten Tomatoes audience score is strong, which means that the people who did show up, the real fans of Whitney Houston, felt that the movie did her justice. So that's nice, and maybe the film could do well on streaming then as a result. As I said in my review last week, it really feels like a television movie, so I think that's where it will do the best. And I, I go watch that review. I think there's some, there's an argument to be made for watching this movie, but not on a big screen. Uh, and two, it's standing next to Babylon, which is an utter failure in every conceivable way, except Golden Globe nominations. Ah, the Golden Globes. As I said, they're making changes, but they're also still ridiculously the same, as in that they're uh, infamously easily distracted by star power and Hollywood glamour. Remember The Tourist and its nominations? Best Picture, Best Actress, and Best Actor? Ricky Gervais had a good laugh about that. In fact, we all did. I think, remember, Angelina Jolie got so upset, but we were like, Come on, it's ridiculous that this movie is nominated. Uh, Babylon is the new tourist, which I think is uh, a big statement in and of itself. Not only is Babylon pretty much DOA with this Rotten Tomato score, audience score, and box office, the movie cost about $100 million to make before advertising and is yet another three hour plus commitment. I mean, for Babylon? Uh, but it's yet another sign that Margot Robbie is even less capable of selling tickets than Ryan Gosling. Remember he consistently comes in around 11 million? Margot Robbie would kill for 11 million. What does this mean for the Barbie movie though? Because with this and Amsterdam, Robbie not only does further damage to her box office track record, which was looking bad to begin with, but is destroying her artistic credibility as well. I mean, at least before she was getting good reviews. Now, you know, who, what, 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 what is she making these movies for? I'd say this is definitely a sign, coupled with the poor box office already for Birds of Prey and the Suicide Squad, that it's time to let another actress have a crack at the Harley Quinn role. But we'll see what James Gunn decides. I mean, what are they saving Margot Robbie's portrayal of this character for? It's not, it's not doing well. Margot Robbie herself isn't doing well. Uh, there are a couple of very vocal fans online that are like Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, but how many times is Warner Brothers gonna fall for that? I think that James Gunn's first big test was whether or not he was gonna get rid of, uh, you know, the big three, Henry Cavill, uh, Ben Affleck, and Gal Gadot. Uh, and he still hasn't clarified 100% on Gal Gadot though, but I think that's because, you know, she's in the Shazam movie. Uh, but I think his next big test, Gunn's next big test, is whether or not he gets rid of Margot Robbie. And I hope he passes. He passed the first test, which was glorious. Uh, but let's see if he can be uh, two for two. Uh, as for the rest of the top 10, Violent Night still managed to hold off the competition despite dropping on streaming Christmas week exactly as I predicted. Thanks to those of you uh, who remembered. I really appreciated that. Uh, right behind that was Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which is closing in on 800 million worldwide. It's still about 150 million behind Multiverse of Madness, and it's not going to be able to close that gap. But at least it topped Thor Love and Thunder. I'd say at this point, with the growth in its audience, an MCU movie needs to break $800 million at the worldwide box office not to embarrass itself. So Black Panther Wakanda Forever is just going to make it. Uh, towards the bottom of the top 10, we have all the awards films that audiences simply do not care about. Uh, as I said, I think, you know, let's see what blockbusters get nominated for the Oscars, but I think the viewership is going to be very low. Uh, even The Whale has lost its momentum, as I also predicted. By the way, I would expect both to be nominated for Best Actor, but I think Colin Farrell will edge up Brendan Fraser for the actual win. I think, uh, I think Brendan Fraser peaked too soon and hasn't been able to... Um, you know, everybody loves a comeback, but also everybody loves a working actor. And I think Colin Farrell really deserves the recognition. And I think the, the whale just simply has not been able to, you know, it got that big standing ovation, which was a really nice headline, but everybody, it's left everybody who's seen it since pretty much scratching their head. 
Strange World rounded out the top 10 just as it hit Disney Plus, uh, you know, for streaming. And we'll know in about a month how it did when Nielsen catches up. Nielsen, you're so far behind. All right, but on that note, let's head over to streaming, starting as always with Nielsen for the week of Thanksgiving. Ah! All right, here you can see Wednesday's domination against all the other streamers. We've been seeing her on the Netflix charts for, for, for weeks. Uh, and once again, Netflix has the entire overall chart to itself, with the exception of Peacock's Yellowstone, an acquired show. So again, that's not even Yellowstone's entire audience. On the originals chart, Andor managed to rise to sixth place, one of the highest places it's been on the top 10, uh, but still couldn't make the overall chart. Uh, that's its final episode. And I think what gave it the boost is people starting to be able to binge, you know, everyone who is waiting to binge. And let's see if Andor can stay in the top 10 next week as well as people binge. That would be a good sign. If it drops out immediately, that would not be great. Uh, and Disney, but again, awards are helping Andor. Awards nominations are helping Andor. And they've, they've already been shooting the second season. So thank goodness they greenlit and started shooting that so quickly before they saw how the show performed. Uh, a big, uh, and also Disney Plus got another show in here with the third episode of The Santa Clauses. It debuted the week before with two episodes. And here with its third episode in week two, it got into the top 10 on uh, o originals. And that's a big win for the mouse to get a non-Star Wars or Marvel show in here. And that's no wonder that The Santa Clauses has already been renewed for a second season. The White Lotus, though, itself still renewed, fell out of the acquired list after making it in last week, which is a little disappointing. Uh, but again, that's not its whole audience. It's just the HBO Max part. But that's still a little frustrating. You would think it would only go up. So if you, if those of you who feel bad who are Andor fans, is, you know, White Lotus is not, you know, burning up the tracks either. Uh, but still, I think it gets enough chatter, and it's not, it's less expensive as a show that it got renewed. And it wins so many awards. So that's another thing that I think helps it. And I think season two will win a lot of awards as well. Let's see. Maybe, you know, White Lotus is not that far into its season on the Nielsen charts. So let's see where it ends. Uh, and then on movies, pretty slow over here. Uh, but while these holiday movies didn't do well enough to break into the overall chart, Will Ferrell, Holiday King, still nabbed sixth and ninth place with his Christmas movies new and old. I mean, that's not great for Spirited, to be honest with you, considering the star power. But I think that also speaks to how many people just have Apple TV, unfortunately. Uh, there's so much good stuff on there. All right, uh, but that's, they gave, you know, Will Ferrell gave significant boosts to Apple TV and HBO Max, who rarely are able to place at all. So they got that going for them. And on Netflix's charts for just last week, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio rose to, num to first place with pretty good numbers, not bad, and Christmas movies, of course, dominated. But this was last week, the week right before Christmas. As for shows, Wednesday is still queen for the fourth week in a row, while Harry and Meghan is also still quite strong, even a little stronger than it was last week. They dropped a second batch of episodes, though, I believe, in the second week, right? Uh, but that's, these are still good numbers. And The Crown, still in the top 10 as well. So people just love the royals. Uh, they might love to complain about them, but who cares? You're still watching. Uh, new series, The Recruit, is also strong enough, I would think, to warrant a second season. That looks pretty good to me. While well, Sonic Prime and Don't Pick Up the Phone did okay in their first weeks. Uh, on iTunes, we're starting to get Universal's game plan, and it worked beautifully for Violet Night. 17 days in theaters, where the film did pretty good, actually, and then hit digital just in time for Christmas itself, where it's been number one since Tuesday when it dropped. The rest of the top 10, understandably, was almost all Christmas movies, because that's for right now, that's for right now, this list. iTunes is pretty much day of. Um, so it's almost all Christmas movies. The Grinches continuing to be everyone's favorite favorites. I love the Grinch movies. I, the, the new latest animated one, I love it. It surpassed the Jim Carrey one, and I love the Jim Carrey one. Uh, well, Knives Out surged to third place as the sequel hit Netflix, because interestingly, Netflix doesn't have the rights to the, film, the first film, which I think is very funny. Uh, also, two, they really burned lines get on that one, boy, but eh, whatever. All right, so it's show business, not show friends. Also, two excellent films that made many critics' top 10 lists for the year, including mine, Top Gun Maverick and The Woman King, are also, doing, are also still doing big business. I'm very happy to see that. I think Top Gun Maverick is a favorite, so people are revisiting that. But I'm very happy to see so many people giving The Woman King a chance and also hear so many of you love it as much as I did. That's great. I'm so happy for that film. Very, people were very unfair to it. Uh, as for this coming week, with New Year's taking over the weekend itself, in theaters, A Man Called Otto hits just New York City and Los Angeles on Friday, 
for a qualifying run for awards season. You just have to be in theaters by December 31st. Uh, while on streaming, White Noise, which already had its limited theatrical release, hits Netflix. Uh, we'll see how that film does. I don't think it's going to be as big as Glass Onion. Glass Onion was big. I can't wait to see those numbers. It trended like all day on Friday when it dropped. Uh, although it's weird. I think that interest was still lower than it was for the first Knives Out. And I wonder if that's because it was, uh, you know, dropped on Netflix. Uh, as for, sh it still shows the power of the multiplex. Um, Streaming, I think streaming shows do quite well, but streaming movies still are not, don't perform, I think, for the most part, the level of a, stream, of a streaming show or a theatrical movie release. I'm curious, what do you think? Uh, all right, so as for shows, Treason dropped today on Netflix with Charlie Cox, while on Friday, Harry and Meghan step behind the camera, this time with a documentary series on Netflix from their production company. While on Sunday, January 1st, Netflix drops kaleidoscope all the other streaming services aren't doing anything but netflix netflix never sleeps uh they're like we can't sleep everyone's gunning for us so another think outside the box show where listen to this this is how this works i looked it up because it's confusing so i looked it up so i could explain it to you the episodes are listed by color instead of number and the only one that's supposed to be watched last is the episode called white which, so that's the finale. But everything else, like red, blue, green, not only is that how they're listed, but they're going to show up in a different order for every viewer. It'll be random. So don't think that, you know, you just have to, you know, it's not like, oh, well, if you just watch them in the order that they're on your screen. Well, it's going to be different for you than it is for someone else. And the idea is, is that the way you watch the episodes will change how you view the story and the characters. So... Is that brilliant? Is that an unnecessary gimmick? Or even worse, a failed gimmick? Netflix doesn't care as long as you watch and you tweet about it. So, and you don't churn. So we'll see what happens. We'll see. I love the cast, but I watched the trailer and I, I was not particularly impressed. But I do love that cast. Uh, so that's this week's movie math. You know what I would like to hear about this week? I would love to hear your Christmas viewing experiences, either at home or at the theater or both. What did you decide to do and how did it turn out? Did you go out in this crazy weather to see a movie? Was it worth it? And then also I'd love to hear what your plans are for this week, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, and if you're planning to watch anything for New Year's Eve and day. Share those thoughts and experiences down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.